Let's get joined up. Today's show is brought to you by Audible, and right now you can get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash joined up. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. So thanks for tuning in to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, a regular show about all things writing, including interviews with authors, screenwriters, and key figures from the publishing industry, plus loads of hints, tips, and inspiration for all kinds of creatives. You can follow us on Twitter at JU Podcast, leave a quick iTunes review, or just tell a friend. Right, cue that cheesy theme tune. Yes, hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, where a little procrastination can go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly, and it's episode 114 with essayist Elena Passarello, a funny, insightful writer who's got a really interesting personal story, as well as loads to say about her writing process, inspiration, and how she found herself being all Marlon Brando in New Orleans. I laughed a lot during a conversation and came away feeling really inspired. Before that, I wanted to make a couple of mentions to listeners. First up, a shout out to Finn Taylor, who tweeted some kind words and is now working through the entire back catalogue of the show, which any of you can do, by the way, for free, just by checking out joinedupwriting.co.uk and subscribing wherever you usually get your podcasts from. Finn listens whilst working outdoors and he's uh, trying to find more time to write himself just go for it Finn even 15 minutes a day can make a huge difference having said that if uh, Finn's working his way through the entire back catalogue in order it's probably going to be several months before he hears this but anyway whenever you get there Finn keep going I also wanted to thank Wyatt R. Smith, a regular listener who took the time to share the show on Twitter and says he finds the podcast helps with motivation and as I replied to him at the time it's your feedback, tweets and emails that motivate me both in my own writing and with continuing to find time to produce the show. Um, so if there's anyone else out there who wants to mention me to mention their project or has a question or some advice they want me to share, do get in touch by tweeting me at JUPodcast or emailing wayne at waynekellywrites.com as I'd love to hear from you. Also, don't forget to join the email mailing list at uh, joinedupwriting.co.uk to get free stuff and be the first to find out about upcoming shows and events. In terms of what I've been up to aside from that, uh, well, aside from lots of filming for an upcoming documentary I'm producing with Matt Holt of Spoonjar Films, I've been working on a new short film script myself and working on the pre-production for my short film Inkling, which we're going to be shooting in October. And thanks to Victoria Goldman's encouragement, I've also just entered my novel Safe Hands into the Capital Crime New Voices competition. So plenty of stuff going on, but I'd still like to return to my novel writing very soon, as if I'm not careful, I'll no longer be on nodding terms with my characters and plot, something that comes up in my chat with Elena Passarello today. So let's use that as a ham-fisted segue to today's interview. Uh, Elena Passarello is an actor, writer and recipient of 2015 Whiting Award. Her first collection, Let Me Clear My Throat, won the gold medal for non-fiction at the 2013 Independent Publisher Awards and she was a finalist for the 2014 Oregon Book Award. Her essays on performance, pop culture and the natural world have all been published in Oxford American Slate, Creative Nonfiction and the Iowa Review and her latest book, Animals Strike Curious Poses, is out right now everywhere you can buy books. I really enjoyed this chat that managed to cover everything from creative writing to Charles Darwin's tortoise, Elvis Presley and Doctor Who, of course. So enjoy. Okay, thanks Eleanor for joining me on Joined Up Writing. Really appreciate it. So just to start things off, why don't you, well, tell us how you're doing, but also where you're speaking from. I'm doing great. Uh, it's a sunny lunchtime here in Corvallis, Oregon, which is all the way on the west coast of the United States, about an hour south of Portland. That's usually a town people know because of TV shows. Yeah. And things. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds, sounds great. So how's, how's everything been going? And tell us a little bit about your latest book, Animals Strike Curious Poses. Great title, by the way. Well, thanks. Um, so Animal Strike Curious Poses came out in the U.S. Uh, in February of 2017. And then I 
think the UK came out with Penguin, Jonathan Cape, uh, about a year later, mm -hmm. and then a paperback uh, pretty recently in the UK. Uh, I've been really fortunate with that book in the UK. Um, and so, yeah, I finished writing it about this time in 2016. Uh, so it's kind of been a while. It's been about three years uh, since I I finished the making of the book. And then it's had a, a sort of long and languorous life uh, for a small press book, at least. It's been pretty nice that I've been able to talk about it for so long. Yeah, it's prob it probably seems like a distant memory since you wrote it, does it? It feels like somebody else wrote it. It's my second <laughs> book. And the same thing happened with the first book, only the first book, when it came out, uh, people talked about it for a little bit and then you know, it sort of it faded away pretty quickly. But I think because of the nature of the second book, the animal book, and because uh, I've been really fortunate about foreign reprints and things, I've been uh, lucky enough to kind of keep talking about this second one. So it's like, it's kind of like talking about like a relationship, maybe that you used to be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you've got fond memories, you, you're at the point where you pass the bitter part. And now you can, you can talk about it freely. And you've got fond memories. That is exactly, yeah, that's 100% right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, tell us a little bit about what, what the book is for people that uh, are not familiar with it. Sure. Uh, it's an essay collection, um, but it's a linked essay collection. So in my brain, I wanted to make a book before I even knew what the subject matter was, where you could read the essays separately, but if you took the book on, as a whole, it would sort of feel like one big essay. Uh, they sort of the essays sort of kind of connect to each other in these strange ways. Uh, but uh, the subject matter is famous animals in human history. Kind of, uh, it's modeled after a medieval bestiary or bestiary uh, book of beasts. So there's um, each essay covers one animal. Uh, that did something in human history that made us take note. So all of the animals in the book, one of the rules, they had to be named mm -hmm. and we had to have recorded them in the human historical record in some way. So some of the essays, um, one of the essays is about um, a very famous circus elephant here in the United States. Another one is about the first North American female in space mm -hmm. who was a Spider named Arabella, who spun a web on Skylab back in 1973. Wow. Yeah, she's she's pretty amazing. Uh, there's a chicken that lived without a head for 18 months. Uh, Jurors Rhino is in there. Albrecht Jurors, uh, famous. Uh, it's in the British Museum, actually. Woodcut of a, a rhino uh, is in there. Um, yeah, a World War One fighting pigeon, <laughs> the horse that could do math. Clever Hans is in there. <laughs> So it's like it's sort of like a, a greatest hits album of, um, of 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 animals. Yeah, um, I didn't want to do any of the big like Paris Hilton's dog kind of a thing, but I'm I'm just really fascinated by what happens when I wanted to write a book about animals, but that topic was way too big, so I kind of kept narrowing it down and narrowing it down. Um, and uh, I decided that I, the thing that, fast, that kept on fascinating me about the animals that I was researching was the times where we put our human kind of garbage onto the animal, right? We, we, we use the animal as a mirror, right? Or what, whatever is happening with us culturally. Right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's the book. I don't know. But it's yeah, a good I way guess. to kind of pick your way through different times and different eras and kind of see how it reflects back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I think I realized about halfway through this quote unquote book about animals that really what I was doing is writing a book about people. <laughs> yeah 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 well, it, yeah well and it's and obviously i referenced the title for, for non-prince fans tell tell people where the um the title comes from oh yeah um uh, my publisher is a non-prince fan so i think the whole reason that the book <laughs> is called animal strike curious poses is that is that she didn't catch it because i think if she would have known that i was naming the book after a lyric <laughs> from one of the most litigious famously litigious <laughs> songwriters in American history, she would have said, no way, Jose. <laughs> so you snuck but, it under the wire. <laughs> yeah. Well, when doves cry, you know, it, Prince has a lot of animal yeah. imagery in his songs. But when doves cry, kind of one of his most famous songs off Purple Rain, um, uh, has this line, animal strike curious poses. It comes kind of in the middle of nowhere in a line. He's just sort of talking about love. And then yeah. he's just imagining this courtyard for some reason where there are animals striking curious poses. 
And I, I feel like that's what the book kind of wants to do. It kind of wants to put animals into these kind of strange situations in order for humans to sort of think about their own lives. And then also it's, it's kind of weird and interesting and pop and, and yeah. So the, the lyric for me was really important uh, when I was putting it together. Yeah. It's a great title. So what would you say, do you remember kind of the initial spark for this? When was there like a particular idea or a particular story that you came across that where you thought, Oh, this, this is, could be the idea for my next collection. Yeah. Um, I feel like, I feel like when you're putting together a kind of a themed collection, I don't know if poets feel this way, um, but as an essayist, I definitely feel this way for both the first and the second book. There are about three moments of kind of discovery, um, in, you know, when, mm -hmm. when you're like, uh, oh, this is, I'm onto something. This is something I could do for an extended period of time. Oh, this is what the book is, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And the first spark was, um, I just, I was in graduate school. It was my first week of graduate school, which was years and years and years before that the book came out. Um, and the, the, my workshop leader asked me to ask the class to come in with a one page essay to get things rolling. And I, uh, I did not come from a, I, I didn't have as much of a writing background as a lot of the people that I found myself in grad school with, which we could talk about later if you want. Uh, yeah. and so I, um, I was terrified. And I just, the only thing I knew to do, I worked as an actor for a really long time was to go back and look at Shakespeare. Cause mm -hmm. I thought maybe I would have a little bit on, you know, like one up on. Yeah. On yeah. <laughs> like, you can, right? yeah. Yeah. You can out bard them. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I wanted to out bard them. That's right. <laughs> and I, I opened up the complete works and there was this footnote, um, in the Merry Wives about, uh, this reference to this bear, Sackerson, that's in the Merry Wives of Windsor. And, um, uh, it, the footnote said that Sackerson, this bear who was in the bear baiting rings, the bear garden, which was right next to the, the globe theater, uh, and shaped almost identical to the globe theater back in the, uh, turn of the, uh, 16th to the 17th century. Um, that this, this was the only rival that Shakespeare actually names in one of his plays. He was a rival because he was you know, competing for ticket sales to his, his bear baiting, his fighting other animals in this bear baiting ring. And, um, and Shakespeare kind of references quietly lots of other competitors, right? Like mm -hmm. Christopher Lowe or the children's company in Hamlet. But apparently the only time he ever dropped the name of somebody who was, you know, taking tickets away from his mm -hmm. Hamlet <laughs> was this bear. And I, and I, I immediately knew what I wanted to write about. And I wrote this essay that's nothing like anything that appears in the book, but, um, it was the, it was sort of like, oh, this was great. This was really fun. Um, I, I think this fascination is something that is unique to my brain. Um, and so then years later, when I was thinking about maybe extending this, I tried to write three more things that kind of captured that same sort of idiosyncratic spark in my brain mm -hmm. as a researcher. And once I had done those three, uh, then I had a sense for, oh, so this is what the book needs to be about, right? Uh, so it was kind of a, and, and that, that sort of yielded another maybe three or four essays. And then, then I had a shape and a structure and things like that. Does that make sense? It does. It does make sense. Yeah. So there'll be a lot of people listening, listening to this that probably mainly consume novels and perhaps sort of standard, I don't want to use that use, but like that, that word, but sort of standard nonfiction books about maybe a particular event or personality or a topic. And when they think of essays, uncultured people like myself they're probably thinking about the things they were forced to write in school or college so the stupid question will be what do you consider to be an essay what what is an essay to you yeah um that's a great question i feel like my i feel like i teach at a university here in oregon and between teaching and writing i think my life's work is to help <laughs> people who the word essay was completely ruined by <laughs> By grammar school in grade yeah, yeah. college, where it's this five paragraph thing with the supporting sentences and you have to cite your sources and stuff. But, um, you know, the essay was sort of born, um, well, it was born in a lot of different places, but it was born, you know, uh, before Shakespeare uh, and sort of named by Montaigne, Michel de Montaigne, right? The French philosopher and thinker. Mm -hmm. And he just... Uh, when he called what he wrote essays, nothing really had ever been published like them. Um, he used the word essay in old French, which means to try or to put on trial or to sort of 
uh, to sort of weigh and try like sure. you would yeah. to say. And that's what I think an essay is rather than some kind of five paragraph thing that proves that something exists or defends a point, although mm-hmm. that could definitely be a point of essays. I think it's this, a singular person, um, getting into a situation where they are thinking deeply about a topic that interests them and then trying to convey whatever that fascination is and maybe even failing. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think Montaigne was sort of obsessed with failure in this wonderful way. Um, and, uh, and, and there've been many enthusiasts of Montaigne and other proto essayists like say Shonagon in Japan and, Ralph Waldo Emerson and William Hazlitt, great British essayist. But I think the thing that they all have in common is they're using this kind of the properties of like rhetoric and speech and research and scene to make these kind of unwieldy, uh, idiosyncratic, fascinating uh, portraits of minds at work. You know, like um, that's not like. I don't think that's going to sell a lot of essay collections to talk about it that way, mate. Well, I can I can probably help you because, I, I mean, I'll be completely honest. Until I started, and I've started reading um, Animal Strike Curious um, Poses, and I really like it. But until I'd actually read that, I can't ever remember a, ever reading a collection of essays. But having having um, started to, to read your book, I would say it's kind of... Um, it's kind of an exercise in empathy in some ways, and you know, there is a big overlap with fiction in the fact that you are putting yourself into a certain situation and you're trying to look at it from different angles and you're trying to put the reader there like you do with any good writing and you're trying to evoke certain emotions or a sense of place or a sense of time. Um, and I think, you you know, you're really successful at that. And I think it's it's just entertaining and it, it pulls you in and it also makes you think about something more deeply and a little bit differently than you might have done had somebody just given you a newspaper article about, you know, a woolly mammoth being dug up, say, for example, or, or whatever it might be. So as a lay person, that's kind of that's kind of, kind of how I came to it. I like what you said about empathy. And when you first said it, I thought you were saying it requires a lot of empathy on the part of the reader, which is probably true, too. Right. Like, yeah, sure. Yeah. A lot of great essayists, I think, are playing with the fact that, like, who would ever just want to sit still and listen to a person thinking or telling stories based on what's going on in their own heads. Right. Which is yeah. what a poet does. You know, a lot of people do it, but like, um, uh, like, uh, uh, Zadie Smith, you know, the great yeah, fiction yeah, writer, yeah. British treasure. Uh, uh, she has, she's a wonderful essayist. Mm-hmm. And, um, I think she really enjoys kind of checking in with the reader every once in a while and kind of being like, are you still paying attention? Are you? <laughs> yeah. Cause it's so, it's like, you're just listening. I think her essay collection is called changing my mind. And that's, that's what, it, you know, it's like, uh, the reader has to be kind of empathetic, um, and, and sort of know that they're going to be kind of guided through whatever the essayist wants to talk about. Um, on the essayist's own terms. So maybe that empathy sort of is reflexive. Maybe it goes both ways. I think it does. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, And I think obviously reading is a kind of two-way experience anyway. I mean, you are, you're conjuring up a certain picture in your mind and you're trying to communicate that over to the reader. But I mean, I think Stephen King talks about it you know, in on writing as well, that kind of magic trick, that idea. I think he, I think he actually describes, he talks about um, a table and I think he puts like a cup or something on it. And then he says, well, I'll, I'll tell you what the table that I'm imagining is this. And you'll probably imagine it to be this because I haven't told you what material it is or what light it is in the room. And on and on it goes. And there is kind of an element of that, isn't there? Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, I love that book. That's the only Stephen King book I've ever read. <laughs> it's it, it, Honestly, it. Could, I would say, I mean, probably it's partly to do with the fact that I'm always talking about it. But I do find that probably every other guest that I speak to, it comes up somewhere or they'll mention it or I'll mention it. So it is one of those kind of, it's ended up being like one of those universal, those universal books. It's such a great book. It it really is. It's like, it's a great book. I find that if you ever just struggling for like a little bit of motivation or, you know, wondering why you write, I think if you kind of go back to that book, it's just, it's just so inspiring. And it just kind of, I don't know. It's like putting on a pair of comfy, shoes or something and going out for a run but it's just it's such a it's such a um it's such a great a great book so yeah it comes up regularly on here that's good to hear yeah he it's like a like a devotional you know that the, the devotional book yeah like, yeah 
where you just have like little religious stories by your bedside if you're yeah, feeling Yeah, you're angry. right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like kind of, that for writers. Yeah, you can just top you can just top it up. Yeah. I I completely agree, yeah. So so in terms of um so what do, what do you love about this particular medium? Why why did you settle on I know I know you've done other bits of writing and stuff as well, but obviously this seems to be kind of your chosen your chosen medium at least at the minute. So what is it that you love about it and why did you settle on this and say not fiction. Maybe you're doing fiction as well. I don't know, but obviously the books that have come out so far have been essays. Well, the honest answer I think um, is that I'm not. I can't do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I took. I accidentally. I went to uh, grad school at the University of Iowa, and um, I accidentally got into a fiction workshop. I thought it was a craft class where we would just be reading books and talking about them, but then the the teacher, this amazing fiction writer named Kevin Brockmeyer was like, okay, your first story is due in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> your stomach and went I, over. It was just like a dream, a bad dream that I had. <laughs> but um, he, uh, I when I so I, I tried to do, write these short stories for this class. And um, I, I would constantly have all the characters and I would get them into a room. And then I would, I wouldn't know how to get them to do anything. It would be like, I set up a bunch of Lego men and the scene. <laughs> just, just, so I think the first, the, the first thing that I need as a writer is um, some kind of relationship to uh, fact, to something that already happened somewhere outside of my brain that I can then mess with. Yeah. Right. I see. So that's the first thing that I need. I know fiction writers do that too, right? Yeah, but, sure. Um, yeah. Um, and then I think, you know, poetry is uh, pretty old and fiction um, is pretty old. At least, you know, it's not as old as the essay, depending on who you talk to, but like nonfiction right now, especially essays, it's kind of like, because it's so recently become a part of uh, contemporary publishing culture, mm -hmm. it's like the wild, wild West. People are doing, you know, they're really uh, just trying a whole bunch of wacky new things. Um, it's a place for a lot of play, a lot of rule breaking. There's this wonderful fusion between the kind of freedom of what poets do and the sort of space that prose gives you that mm -hmm. the essay allows for. And then on top of that, there's this really interesting tradition that has kind of not been paid that close attention to over the past like 30 years. But before that, it was quite venerable. So it's both this like mix of tradition and this like i don't know i guess you could do that give it a shot you really feel like you're like a part of a movement in the essay world um and uh and i've just i've seen some of the most like gloriously daring material come out of essay writers of the past like 20 or 30 or 20 years you know so i really like that i like that if i want i can you know um like there's an essay in the book called Harriet, which is about a um, Galapagos Island tortoise that was purportedly, it lived to be 175. She died in like 2006. And um, she purportedly had been owned by both Charles Darwin and Steve Crocodile Hunter Irwin. <laughs> <laughs> what a ride. So, I know, right? That's, that's exactly exactly what I thought. I was like, this is like some kind of like Madame Bovary, Tess of the Durberville, <laughs> land of shit, man. And then, the, of course, we don't necessarily know if, if that's even possible. And the reason that the claim was made was the zoo, Steve Irwin's zoo really wanted to sort of assign this pedigree to her. And they sure. kind of mandered a bunch of facts about the whaling industry and Charles Darwin and kind of the history of uh, zoology in, uh, in the south co coast of Australia. They just wrenched these facts to like make it so that if you bought a ticket to their zoo, they could they could say you're seeing a Charles Darwin tortoise, right? And uh, I was just like, well, I mean, if this zoo can take facts and make them do that, then I'm going to take even more facts and I'm going to make a bodice ripping love story between <laughs> <laughs> and you know, like it's an essay because it's, you know, I think it's using facts to sort of contemplate our relationship with truth in the world. And it has these kind of big ideas. It's not leaning on storytelling the way that a piece of historical fiction would. And it's just crazy and nuts. And a lot of people are really upset by it because it's like there's a sex scene between Charles Darwin and a Galapagos <laughs> Island tortoise. Apparently you're not supposed to do. But in my weird little coven of essayists, it's kind of like, it's like, you know, like w when Jimi Hendrix started playing the guitar with his teeth or something, not sure, that I'm yeah. Jimi Hendrix of anything, I'm certainly not, but it's just like, 
okay, let's try something. Let's do this. You know, it's just this dare. Uh, and I love, I love that freedom and that like challenge. And, um, it just sets my, my imagination just on fire, you know, to, to brave, think. Yeah. Brave new frontier to explore. Yeah. 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 So have you, w- would you ever attempt fiction or, or kind of straight nonfiction? Have you got any of the plans to do any of that stuff going forward or do you think you'll just be, your heart belongs to essaying and that's it? Right now I'm trying to think about a big, we call it narrative nonfiction, the kind yeah. of like, like, you know, um, I'm trying to do one right now because uh, I, as much as I love the essay, I also have this like stinky dream of having my book appear in a lot of airports, you know, like I want to yeah. like, yeah. I mean, my book is in a couple of airports, but it's always like strangely shelved, like in self-help or something. Um, but right. <laughs> I want like one of those ones that like somebody who's just like got like a 10 hour flight and they're just desperate to be kept company. I want them to browse and find it and pull it. And like, I want to like, I want somebody to take me with them on a plane, my book with them on a plane, you know, like, it's just like a, a dirty desire that I have, I guess. Um, so I am going to try right now. I'm in the process of trying to do a book length narrative nonfiction thing. So we'll see. <laughs> oh, that sounds interesting. That sounds interesting. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? You kind of touched on it earlier on in the intro. So where, where you grew up and some of the stuff you, you did, you kind of touched on your, your acting as well but before you settled into your teaching and writing career. Sure. Yeah. I, so I, uh, I'm in my 40s, just barely. Thank you very much. Me too. Uh, but, <laughs> welcome, welcome to the fourth school. <laughs> I've been, so uh, I, uh, I grew up in the American South. I spent nine years in South Carolina and nine years in Georgia. And then I went to university in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I spent nine years there total. It didn't take me nine years to go to college. But <laughs> I, just, I stuck around afterwards. That's where I met. Leave, yeah. Yeah, no. Well, Pittsburgh is is the best place in the world. That should be like if you have two hours for another podcast, I can tell you why everybody. <laughs> should. That's where I met Paul Tudor Owen, who I know yeah. has been on your show. We yeah. were we were sort of like writing buddies back in the day. Uh, anyway, so um, and I did study writing in university, but uh, I also studied theater. And when I graduated, when I was twenty two, I, I Pittsburgh is actually a pretty good town for film, theater, and voiceover. Mm-hmm. And so I stuck around for about, gosh, like five or six years uh, doing that. And um, when I was about 27, I decided that I wanted to go to grad school. And I picked writing uh, because it seemed I was kind of sick of a certain kind of practice in theater, which is it's not a bad practice. It's just um uh, and, and, and now, now that I've, now that I'm out of theater, I realized that uh, I'm constantly putting myself back into this situation that I was trying to escape. But in theater, you know, you're kind of told everything, right? Mm-hmm. You're told what to say, yeah. you're told where to stand, who to kiss, what to wear, right? When to do it. And, um, and in rehearsals, you're working with all these other collaborators and you have just this little tight cage in which your creativity can work, Right. Um, And that's what makes acting so exciting is people can do amazing things inside those little prisons. And I was kind of curious um, what it would be like, well, A, to eat sandwiches, because when you're an actress, you don't get to eat a lot of sandwiches. (laughs) And B, um, to like have no, have no boundaries, right? To have no other collaborators or no other kind of um, parameters or, or restrictions. But then, of course, I started doing nonfiction, which involves fact. And then I started doing these kind of form formal essays, which often involve like rules, weird rules that I set for myself. So I'm, I'm kind of putting myself back in those cages. <laughs> but I went to grad school um, in the nonfiction writing program at the University of Iowa, which is a very kind of essay focused, essay forward program. Um, there's a, a guy there named John Degada, who um, uh sort of thinks really interesting things about the role of truth in nonfiction and what an essay is as an art form. And that sort of, uh, from there, I just have been teaching and writing. And my first book came from the thesis that I wrote there. And then, as I said before, my second book came from sort of from an exercise (laughs) that I did there. Uh, yeah. Um, my first book came out in 2012. So that was about 
four years after I had graduated from an MFA program. And then five years later, my second book came out. My publisher is, in America is this really interesting uh, group called Saraband, who are really committed to kind of um, unusual approaches to fiction, poetry, and the essay. Yeah, well, tell tell just mentioned you just mentioned about your first book there. That's to do with the voice, isn't it? Give, t- tell us about that book. Yeah, so um, you know, like like I said, I I wanted to just sort of like abandon my theater life, and I was so scared when I went to MFA, and everybody had been to like Yale and already studied with like John McPhee and Joyce Carol Oates, and I was like this, you know, lame actor, <laughs> <laughs> and I never wanted to talk about being a theater person, but pretty quickly uh in like maybe by my second year in grad school I realized that like performance is the thing that I really know how to write about and even the animal book all the animals are kind of performing so I kind of doubled down or I I I went back to my my performance roots and this first book is called let me clear my throat and it's about the human voice in performance so it's a bunch of essays that kind of work together to make a big essay and um, it covers times in human history where somebody has used their voice and we've listened to it in a kind of iconic way. So there's essays about the castrati, the mm-hmm. opera singers, you know, and uh, actually Paul Tudor Owen came with me. Uh, uh, there's this contest that's held in New Orleans every year yeah. on Pen- yeah. James birthday. And uh, you, all these men get on this balcony, uh, under this balcony, and they scream Stella like Marlon Brando yeah. did. The Tennessee Williams, uh, I will play. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I never know what kind of traction like big American theater has uh, other places in the world. So I don't know. If I'm probably that one's pretty big. Yeah, and and obviously that particular performance as well is is okay. is pretty amazing. Yeah. So the Stella, it, it's it's made it across the pond. You guys know that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I, I wrote an essay where I, uh, went down there with Paul, uh, and, uh, a couple other people and I, a woman had never won this contest where you pretend to be Marlon Brando on Tennessee Williams birthday. And I won, <laughs> uh, the contest. And so I wrote an essay about, cause I think that Marlon Brando moment is sort of the quint- quintessential moment in American sound, the, the American vocal sound. Like it's just, it's just very masculine, very American to me. And so I I went down there and I tried to see what it felt like as a woman to try that on. Um, yeah. So uh, how, did, how did it feel? How was it? Well, honestly, like when I put the book, when I was putting the book together, I had already sold the contract. And I had said, when I was meeting with the publisher, there's, you know, a couple other essays that I want to write. There's this contest in, down in New Orleans. And I I wanted to go down there and I wanted to lose because I wanted to make this essay about the kinds of sound spaces women are allowed to embody Uh and the kinds of sounds because women, you know, had never won this contest. If you are a woman who wanted to enter the contest, they would put a dude up there and you would yell Stanley, which which is is not the same. Yeah, (laughs) Totally not the same. Like any enthusiast will tell you ending on an E sound is not nearly (laughs) fun and throat ripping is ending on an A, right? Yeah. Like, opera needs the ah sound La, right? yeah <laughs> so um i in my brain before we went down there i had planned to kind of write about what it meant what it felt like to be a loser right um mm. but then of course you get down there and it's new orleans and i had a bunch of pina coladas and like <laughs> <laughs> it just got really competitive and uh just screamed my ass off and um then i had to rewrite the essay that was in my head. <laughs> <laughs> you were hoisted by your own petard. That's right. Yeah, uh, my petard has never been so hoisted. <laughs> Where does that expression come from? Uh, you, you know, know what? I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's the jumping-off point for the next collection. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's uh it's hard to go for for a title after a Prince lyric, but maybe hoisted on my own petard <laughs> could do the job. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe <laughs> oh it's great being able to as you say explore all these uh all these different things and take them in in different directions so if if i if i or anybody listening to this if they wanted to have a go at this like have a go at i know it's not i'm not suggesting that it's just something you can just knock off obviously it's not but if they wanted to learn more about it and they wanted to learn more about the craft of essay writing essays like this have you got any kind of advice for them or do you think there's a particular route they should take or how would they, how should they get started? 
Oh, that's such a great question. Um, and I'm so, I'm so happy that you asked it. I just, I want more people to obviously read and enjoy contemporary essays, especially kind of essays that push the boundaries of what an essay can do. But I also want more friends. Like I want more people coming in and seeing what they can do with the electric guitar that is this essay. Right. Mm -hmm. thing. Um, so, I mean, sometimes it helps, I think, to just kind of read the genre deeply. Um, uh, luckily the internet makes it pretty simple, uh, to sort of discover essayists who are doing things that are kind of interesting. Um, John Degata is always a really good place to start. He has a anthology called the next American essay and the lost origins of the essay. Um, and they kind of have these great examples of even, um, pieces of writing in other genres that he's decided to claim as essays because yeah. of the things I do, which I, I, I heartily endorse. Yeah. And at, from a writing perspective, I think the thing that separates um, creative nonfiction from the other genres is um, like, so like somebody could, somebody could write about their experience and turn it into a fiction short story, right? Like get uh -huh. stood up prom or something. Um, and, and it could be what some people call like an autobiographical short story. And I think that means like, the the storytelling the scenes itself is doing 99 percent of the work mm -hmm. and uh, and making meaning and making the the sort of literary the structure as much as anything else yeah exactly so uh so yeah so the the sort of narrative drive you, you don't uh you know uh this is this is what i understand at least as mm -hmm. a, a non practicing fiction writer. But if you were going to take that same experience and instead of doing an autobiographical story, recount it in the essay form, there would be a new kind of pressure placed on your insides, right? What you're thinking, yeah. you're feeling, what you now uh, are doing with that information and how you can make you then on the page and the sort of discrepancy between the two selves, all those sorts of things, right, can be a part. Of it. And um, so the a piece of advice that I might give would be to start checking in with yourself as a thinker, as a, a mind that's processing either material that's happened to you, like this autobiographical short story that we're talking about, or um, like what I do, like reactions to popular culture, like start like, start like thinking about yourself as sort of a character in the way that you process the world. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, right. And then, um, and because I think, that's what that's what the essay game is all about. Like, look at this mind and what it's doing with these experiences that we either share or understand or have some sense of. Right. That's the joy. Like, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No. Yeah. No. I was I was going to say. I mean, to, hearing you talk about it like that, I can sort of see uh, where there would be more overlaps with the performance thing as well, because to me, it almost sounds like what say a good stand up com uh, comic would do you know in terms of taking the world uh, looking at it in a very uh, idiosyncratic kind of way or at least from your unique viewpoint and sort of turning it on its head and looking at it from different angles and then sort of commenting on it and reflecting back there's kind of a similarity there i know that uh, i know that it's you're not always going to be going for humor but do you, i don't know do you think that's kind of a fair um comparison absolutely yeah and i have a um, I, te I teach in a graduate program now and, and I'm always trying to come up with classes that interrogate the students into thinking about the, the things that are inside the genre rather than like the definitions of the genre itself. And one of the things that I do is I, I teach a class in storytelling and we do stand up comedy and monologues and Ted talks. And we just like try to get in touch with, again, this is theater, right? Like we just try to get in touch with like our, our commentative voice mm -hmm. outside of the parameters of like paragraphs and shit, you know, mm. well, can I see your podcast? I'm sorry. I'm just, yeah, like, you sorry. have, you're fine. You're good. You're fine. Okay. Good. Well, damn it. Yeah. I mean, that's, okay, so, that, that's a, that's a mild one anyway. That's fine. <laughs> test me, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You get five <laughs> points for that one. So yeah, keep going. <laughs> oh, good. Bingo. Um, but yeah, you know, like kind of uh, just kind of shaking out the 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 mind, the, the mind as it's working in addition to the writer that's trying to make writing. Right. Like mm -hmm. and I think stand up comedy and storytelling and stuff like that is really good for that because it's just like pure commentary. It's pure. Here I am saying what I think 
uh, outside of like, oh, I really think the scene should be very lovely or these are the, this is the vocabulary I want to use or structurally this is how I want to approach this. Um, so, yeah, I think that that correlation is really fair. So if you were sitting down tomorrow to start a new project, whether that's just an essay on its own or you were starting to think about a bigger collection of linked essays or whatever, have you got a specific process? It sounds like there's lots of research involved. How, do, how would you approach it if you were sitting down to start a new project tomorrow? totally research. I would, I, I, it's like a, it's like a real, a relationship. Like I, in the beginning, when I get these little scratches of, even if it's for a short thing or for a book, I get these little, like, Hmm, I'm kind of attracted to, um, some kind of reality that I've uncovered or some factoid that's flashed across the screen. And I dig a little deeper and I dig a little deeper and then it's kind of like swiping right or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> And then I take myself out on dates with the subject and watch films, listen to music, uh, go down Wikipedia wormholes, really irresponsible research wormholes, and <laughs> um, really just let myself sort of um, get to know what what's happening, get to, get to know the thing that sort of sparked my interest. And I'm sort of keeping track in a, like a little notebook next to me like the things that are pinging my particular in, in interest in the subject matter. And then I, you know, if I can pinpoint something specific, then I spend a few weeks trying to write that fascination as a short piece. And then usually around the time that I finish this kind of do -si do of researching and reacting, I have a shape or a first line or something. And um, that's when I feel like I'm actually in a relationship with the project, right? Like, uh, so there's just this kind of weird sniffing around the world to try to get a sense of, um, is, is this the one? Yeah. yeah. And what does it mean? So the, the one thing that I don't ever want an essay to be, or at least the kind of essays that I do is what I call the, isn't this cool thing where you're just saying, isn't this cool? Isn't this yeah. cool? That yeah. This tortoise hang out with Darwin and Irwin. There's got to <laughs> Something on top of that that is usually connected to how me thinking about the essay sort of says something about the way that I see the world, right? Like, um, like for the Brando thing, right? I thought that the Brando thing was so cool, and then, but I wanted to say more about that, and then I started learning or started thinking about all of these plays in which women had to pretend to scream or be silent, and where men got to sort of like let her rip, like from Shakespeare on. And so I knew then that on top of the coolness of the Brando Stella scream, I had to like talk about this, this sort of commentary that's like gendered. And then I found that contest and it was like, I call it, here's five more points. I call it the oh shit moment. It's the <laughs> moment where you know what the subject is, you know what your interest is, and then something else, like a third thing on top of it will tell you how the essay needs to be shaped. And I was like, oh shit, this is a an immersion piece where I put myself in the driver's seat of this particular conundrum and go down there and buy a plane ticket, you know, and 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 con my friend to coming down with me. And um and I use that experience to talk about both the subject and my reaction to it. Does that make sense? It does. And, and, and in that particular instance, obviously, it's sort of a great way uh, of, of making it, com you know, very, very unique and very, very, very idiosyncratic. It's completely from your viewpoint. And it's something that you actually you lived part of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm not I'm, I'm kind of a rarity. I think I think most essayists and nonfiction writers often use the self pretty heavily in their work. Um, there's a lot of first person and a lot of I went out to experience this. But mm -hmm. I find my I, I hide a lot. Like maybe that's one of two essays in the first book that use the self. And then in the, the animal strike, um, there's only one first person essay. Um, but that's, that's unusual. I think, um, in terms of the essay world, I think a lot of people are really drawn to essays because it gives them that kind of stand up comedian slash Ted place of really uh really centered eye-based storytelling which i love i mean i love i love the way zadie smith makes herself a thinker on the page in her essays and mm. yeah really if this topic takes anybody anywhere i just hope that they'll read like joy this wonderful essay of hers about what it means to experience joy uh, she's great <laughs> yeah it sounds great so why yeah. do you why do you think uh, you mean to use your phrase why do you think you hide tend to hide why do you think you're drawn to kind of not take that traditional thing and be more content to sit behind a 
uh, you know, a, a, maybe a high concept or something like that? I think it comes back to theater. I think, you know, when you're getting ready, when you get a job, you, um, you, the job is to put on, a, you know, literally the shoes of another person and, uh, solve problems and think about the world and express yourself through this kind of shell. And, and then other people are building like worlds for the shell to live in like sets and sound and stuff. So all the research I do, I think is like what a set or costume designer would do. And then all the expression is sort of me kind of hiding inside the world of, you know, St. Francis of Assisi and the wolf or, you know, whatever, uh, Sackerson, the baited bear. And, Mm -hmm. um, I think it's like, I think, and it's funny because I, I, this, this might, we've only been speaking for just 40 minutes, but it may become very obvious. I have no, I love talking about myself. Like I, as a person, I'm very eyes focused, but, uh, as an essayist, I think, um, I think the engine for me, it, it, it's most accessible when I'm, I'm sort of hiding behind a curtain, you know? Sure. You like to put on the, some, the costume of, of somebody else basically and try on a different role are you a fiction writer wayne i am actually yeah does that is it similar for it is for yeah i mean i i i i'm the same and i i mean i think it would like any writing i think you, or subconsciously or otherwise you kind of end up you always end up putting something of yourself in there or your own experiences or whatever probably without realizing but yeah i'm the same you know um i i love the the thing I love about writing the most is the fact that you can use your imagination and that comes back to that empathy thing again and picking a character that on the face of it might be a bad person in inverted commas or at least they're morally grey or whatever and being able to try them on for a while and sort of, you know, t- um, take them for a ride if you like and see where it goes and try to think about what motivates them and how they might think and how they experience things. I think that's... Yeah, I think that's great fun. So it's it, it you know it sounds like it's a similar for you when you write your 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 pieces. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And that's I mean that's the other thing that I love about the essay is that it's a real thieving genre, right? Mm-hmm. Like you see a lot of lyricism from poetry and a lot of kind of formal rule breaking from poets. And I think we steal the um, the ability to sort of like drive other characters through scene work that from fiction writers. You know, like there's plenty of journalism stuff that we filch <laughs> yeah yeah like you say so it sounds like it's you can almost throw the kitchen sink at it yeah yeah it's great <laughs> and that's what you love about it so yeah, just totally. so just as we kind of move towards uh wrapping things up so if you were starting out again tomorrow as a new writer what if anything would you do differently or is there anything you'd go back and tell your younger self either don't do that or do that or think about something differently i think when i was a young writer i think i had like an image in my head about how it was going to go based on like a success model or like TV or something like, Mm -hmm. and then you make a book and then you do this and this needs to happen by this time. And, um, none of that really seemed like, like, like I was always kind of like, Oh, I'm 30. I don't have a book yet. You know? Um, and like, it's, that's, I, what a waste of time that was like a book, a book, you know, we just lost Tony Morrison today. And yeah, her first book came out when she was 39 years old and uh it uh it you know changed it changed american literature and probably world literature forever uh, uh i don't know i i think i think and then i think i also just genre wise had a version of that in my brain too like oh a book has to be like this book that I keep on reading about in the newspapers or a book has to be with the majority of people who are thinking deeply about writing that I know are working on. Mm -hmm. And I think I wasted a lot of time trying to disguise myself as someone who a understood what it meant to put a book out by a certain time and B was trying to make something that looked like what other things were. And it's just like, I don't know, like I, I, it's not that it, I, 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 every time I tried to do it, I ended up eventually getting to the place where I made the things that made sense to me, but it took a lot more time than it, it was a bit more tortuous than you expected and wanted yeah. it to be. Maybe I should, and here's a less negative piece of advice. Like the, the thing that, um, a lot of people come ask me about like how you work through writer's block or confidence issues. Uh-huh. And that's another place I think where kind of creative nonfiction writing about the world essay can really help because 
every single day I sit down to write, I'm so sick of myself, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm never sick of the subject matter because I've been on all those dates and I figured out that I'm truly fascinated with the tortoise or the spider or Marlon Brando. And I can always plug into the unrelenting enthusiasm that either I or the world has for that topic. And so it's not like, it's wonderful. You get to deflect all of the the negative feelings you have about yourself as a writer and just talk and just like use the perpetual motion machine of something that truly fascinates you. And so if you can stay to steal Joan Didion's line, if you can stay on nodding terms with the thing that fascinates you about what you're writing about, um, I think it will save a lot of kind of like hinky feelings and emotional heartache <laughs> as you're putting stuff together. Yeah. Try stay in touch with the thing that fired you up in the first place. Yeah. And, and sometimes that means like not, not engaging with the word document that you're writing on, taking a notebook somewhere and just talking to yourself about, about the, the spark that's, in, you know, uh, and sort of keeping, keeping that fresh. I've, I've so many times I've gone away from the project and sort of reinvigorated myself by just having a little conversation away from the work about why I'm doing this, why it's exciting, why it matters, what, what stake I have in the work, what I want. And it feels like when I come back, like there's this new gasoline, right? Like, uh, the, 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 there's usually some kind of an answer to how to make me feel better when I'm thinking in this way away from the project. Like, Oh, you should just go watch a movie about the subject matter, or you should, um, make a playlist for yourself, or you should go back and find somebody who's writing about something similar um, and, uh, just sort of drink in the way that they're covering it. Or you should find somebody who's writing about something completely different, but has the music that you want and just let that music sort of inspire you. Those kinds of tasks, the little assignments, mm -hmm. they come from that keeping on nodding terms with, with your enthusiasm as well. It sounds like, again, to come back to your relationship analogy, it's like keeping the relationship going, isn't it? It's keeping the, uh, it's keeping the excitement in the relationship. Yeah, you got to go on a couple's retreat. With your <laughs> Bit of role play. Yeah, keep it fresh. That's right, keep it fresh. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, well, I think that's that's a good place to wrap it up. But where, just tell us, give us a, can you give us a sense of what's up next and where people can find out more about you and your work? Um, well, my website is elenapassarello.com uh, and the um, – yeah, it's got it's got some links and stuff. Uh, I'm also on Twitter uh, as Elena Vox, E L E N A V O X, and um, lots of uh, people who are interested in where what to read next essay wise. There's nothing I love more than retweeting cool things that are being written. Uh, and then the next project, I'm actually leaving in a couple days to go to Memphis, Tennessee, uh, yeah. where Graceland is, because yeah. I feel like. I, f I don't know what's going to happen yet, but um, I want to do something with Elvis Presley. As soon as you said Memphis, I thought you were going to go to Elvis Presley. That's great. Good. I'm glad that you. I'm glad that you made that association. I'm yeah. always worried writing about a guy who's been dead for 42 no, years. No, he's cultural <laughs> icon. <laughs> Are you a fan? I am actually. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Have amazing. you ever uh, Have you ever been an Elvis impersonator? It's a long shot. No, I haven't. Unfortunately, oh. <laughs> no, I haven't. Uh, did you did you get to see the did you watch the documentary actually called Oh Orion Orion yeah. that's it yes oh. thank you That's an incredible yeah that guy oh man Have you seen the documentary about it as well uh, Yes yeah, yeah. he's cuz that's a British but yeah British um film uh, documentarian that made that film uh oh. she's kind of local localish to where I'm based she's kind of from a similar part of the world but yeah I remember watching that documentary and uh yeah, it's just a fantastic story. Um, uh, yeah, that guy. I, I was when I was first thinking about making an Elvis project. I was like, I got to go talk to him, and then I realized he was no longer with us. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. Oh, oh that's so cool! You know that? That's great. That makes me feel like I'm not, uh, I'm not just writing. You know, I'm a southerner. I'm of, of a certain age. Sometimes I wonder if he's, if, if he's maybe not. On no, the, on the... I think no. I think he's one of those things. I think it's. As you say, I mean, the impersonating thing actually is is a good angle. It is one of those things. It's like even if people, I think even people from the generation before us, I think if somebody did kind of a, you know, the kind of comedy Elvis impression, I think people would probably get it. They would probably know 
you know, kind yeah. of what it references, even if they don't know. You know, I always think people, depending on how old you are and how much you know about it, you everyone's kind of got their own version of Elvis in their mind. Some people yeah. have got that. Unfortunately, they've got that kind of overweight, washed up has been that he was just before he died and then other people have got the you know the guy that broke out in the 1950s and other people have got the comeback special and i think oh this it's almost like doctor who i think he kept regenerating and he kept yeah. coming back as all these different characters <laughs> i've never heard him compared to doctor who but that's totally no, neither have i i don't know where that came from but um well done. <laughs> <laughs> oh i'm that. Yeah, so please cool. yeah, please do. Yeah, please do. But <laughs> I I think it's true. He did he did, you know, he did keep having to um reinvent himself. Um and sometimes, you know, it wasn't it, it was just through what happened to him and kind of what he was going through, but yeah, I mean, it is it is it's a it's a tragic story, but then, you know, I do think people when people say that, they sort of forget that, you know, for sort of 90% of the time it was amazing. It was only really the last bit that was horrible you know i think that's totally right i think uh i think a lot of people yeah and um because it's I, like if you, if you watch the like the 1972 um that's the way it is if you watch the that kind of uh you know the live concert film he's like slim i mean you know he's got those sequin yeah. jumpsuits on and everything but he's like slim he's absolutely on the top of his game he's having you know he's he's laughing and joking and stuff and messing around it's it's yeah. you know and that's only a few years before he died you know your stuff. This a little is, bit, yeah. This is giving me life. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. That's a nice little, um, a nice little coincidence. We end on the, we end on the king. Yeah, well, you know his, uh, uh, yeah. Where it, it, this is the right time of year to do it. A lot of people think about Elvis around the second week of August. I knew you're, yeah. you're going to be right at some other time, but um, it's it's when he died, and um, uh. He died 42 years ago this year when he was 42. So it's a real milestone. He's he's been dead longer than he's been alive. Yeah, and that's so true. The, yeah, he the, died. Yeah, he died the same year I was born. Did he? Yeah. Ah, so you're in the club. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I was. Uh, I always think. So I had a when I was thinking about this Elvis project, I um, I had to have a really awkward conversation with my parents because I was born. Uh. A few, like eleven months or so after he died, but uh -huh. nine, like I, but I, I talked to them. And they're, they're divorced, so that was even weirder. <laughs> I think I was conceived the weekend of Elvis's last live show. <laughs> Coincidence? You decide. <laughs> we have the same initials. Dun dun dun. <laughs> <laughs> well what a terrible uh, way to end suspicious <laughs> suspicious minds um will always go to that kind of thing so <laughs> <laughs> that's just the way it is that's okay. <laughs> and unfortunately your parents are now in heartbreak hotel but you know you <laughs> can't have everything <laughs> <laughs> oh, if we make any more of these puns we're going to be put in the yeah i could don't get me started on puns we could be here all night but um <laughs> Okay, well that's great. Oh, well, it's re it's been really really good to talk to you. Good luck uh, with the latest edition of uh, Animal Strike Curious Poses, and good luck with the. I can't wait now to see how the new project develops as well. So I'll be uh, I'll be keeping an eye on that. That sounds great. Thanks so much. I love the podcast, and it was a real pleasure to be on. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so there you go. Okay, thanks again to Elena Passarello, and you should definitely check out Animal Strike Curious Poses and her other works all out right now. And I'll put all of those links in the show notes over at joinedupwriting.co.uk. That's it for this week, but don't forget you can find the entire back catalogue, as Finn's been enjoying, of the interviews on the website, and make sure you subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever else you get your podcasts to have the podcast downloaded automatically every week. Also remember to get in touch with all your writing news, views, questions or comments, and I'll give you a mention in a future show. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm Wayne Kelly. Happy writing and reading, and I'll see you next time.